We're live on Facebook Live. If you're joining us, welcome. We've just uh, had a, a great time worshiping the Lord today in our, our praise and worship together. And we're just receiving tithes and offerings as an act of worship. You know, tithes and offerings is not paying bills. Tithes and offering is an act of worship. We give them our praise, we give them our voice, but we give tithes and offerings to say this is a very tangible way to recognize that Yahweh, indeed, you have first claim on our life. It's not just words, but it's in the actions we do. Can you say amen? Well, Father, we bring our tithes and offerings into the house. We salt our offerings to remind us that all that is brought into your hands is well preserved. So we worship you. We honor you, sir. We have great expectation that we are partners with what you are doing in this world in the name of Yeshua and God's people said amen and amen. Well, you may be seated. Glory to God. Do you come pre prepared to receive today? Uh, I, I, I trust so. We're going we're to have a delightful time in the word of God today. Uh, we're going to learn some practical things. Uh, we're going to, uh, I trust, um, open up a door whereby you can catch a, a glimpse of, of restructuring things in your life. You know, if you and I come and sit under the teaching of the Word of God and all we get is entertained, then we've missed it. And if all we get is intellectual knowledge, uh, while that is helpful, it doesn't do us any good unless we have a practical application. Come on. It has no degree... No, no, no value in life to have an advanced degree in mathematics, but you can't keep your checkbook balanced. Come on. You know, if you can't do practical math, what is the point of having a theoretical math? And, and if the Word of God doesn't work at the level at which you and I live, if, it's, if, if things are not changing in our life, if, if we're not able to live at a different dimension than the rest of the world, if we're living life just like everyone else lives, at some point, we've got to be honest to say, what is the value of our religion? But, but you see, Yeshua didn't come to bring us religion. He came to make alive the Word of God, to, to re-infuse it with the power that it, that it has in it. And, and so he went about teaching the Word, but, but he taught at different levels. He, he, he taught at, at the surface level. The rabbis have their, their names for it, but at the surface level is the plain meaning. That, that you read it, you understand it, and that's a meaning. But just below that, there is another, another level of understanding. Some people thought that he was just talking about a sower, a farmer, putting seed out into the ground. Others realized, no, no, he's talking about what God puts in our life. And still others then begin to, to digest that and say, then what do I need to do to ensure that I'm the soil that receives the seed? Okay? Different levels at which you're going to go. And, and so we're going to begin to look at something that at first brush seems so natural. And in fact, it's so natural that it's dangerous. Because when you start addressing issues of religious ideas, people say, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, I do that, oh yeah. Who's first in your life? Well, it depends where you are when you talk to people. Come on, you're... you're you're at a gathering of couples and someone says, who's first? They're liable to say, my husband or my wife. But you know, when you're in the church and you say, who's first in your life? There's an automatic response. God's first. God's first in my life. Is he? I I is he really? And, and if he is, what does it mean? But, but we pick up religious ideas and we, we say, like, I've been saved. Saved from what? Save from what? You know, if you're living like the world, if you're as depressed as you were before you got saved, if you still have the problems you had before you got saved, if you still have the anxiety you had before you got saved, come on, then what were you saved from? And, and so the church didn't have an answer to that because what was happening is people's lives were no different. And so they rewrote the theology of the Bible simply to speak about you're saved from hell and get to go to heaven. But the bulk of the Torah, the bulk of the writing of Scripture has nothing to do with getting to heaven. It has to do with how to live successfully in earth. 
Come on. Come on. And, and, and so you and I are the product of probably 500 years, 500 years of preaching that the whole point of salvation is to go to heaven. And, and, and so I get born again, I get to go to heaven. But it has little to, to no impact in terms of our ability to live life here. And friends, that should not be that way. You're saved from one condition to another. You're saved from a negative self-image. You should therefore have a positive self-image. You're saved from sin, so you should be able to be overcoming sin. You're saved from sickness and disease means we should be able to move beyond healing into divine health. But see, the church hasn't taught us that. You're saved so you get to go to heaven when you die. And the devil has successfully stolen from the vast majority of Christians the power of God to live their life filled with his glory and his power and his presence, to live life as an overcomer here. And the devil has stolen it from us. We read verses like, greater is the one that's in you than he that's in the world. Or in Christ you are an overcomer. Or in 1 John, little children, you have overcome them. But inside there's a raging voice that says to you, you're not an overcomer, and you look at your life, and the evidence is in favor of that voice. You know you. Are you an overcomer? Are you able to even overcome someone's negative comment? Christians can't overcome the, the, the silliest of things. Someone says something, and you get ticked off which means that at any point the devil brings somebody's negative word and it triggers you into a foul attitude. You're not an overcomer. What is the value of the Christian faith if it doesn't change our life where we live? Come on. Come on. It's time we wake up and say, either this thing works or it doesn't work. Either I allow it to change my life because I'm not going to play religion anymore. Glory to God. Well, you get all that free. That's not in my notes. <laughs> That's Holy Spirit's warm-up to where we're going, I guess. I, I, I want to talk about who, who goes first. Who goes first? You know, in, in, in life, it's funny. I watch things. But who gets to go first? You know, there are takers and givers in life, and takers usually want to go first. They, they want to be the first ones in line, the first ones to get here. They want to get the best seats. Come on, takers are interested in themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and we've, got a, we've got a major sickness in America right now called self-itis. And, and, and it can't more accurately be reflected than in taking selfies. No, it is. I'm serious. If you just like to post on Facebook selfies, you're a self-centered individual. You've got a spiritual problem, and it will rob you of every blessing of God. It's not, well, it's not serious. It's very serious. It's very serious because it's a symptom of a disease that is killing you. It's very serious that your thought is, I want to take a picture of me. Look at me smile. Look at me look at this. That tells me what's going on spiritually in your life, and that's a disaster, friends. That's a disaster. Come on. It's about time someone begins to point out these cultural things that even Christians get caught up and don't realize the devil is lying to you. He's deceived you. He sold you something that is going to bite you. And then in your older years, you might come and say, oh, I wish I had listened to pastor when I was younger. You cannot do the things the world does. It's not neutral. There's an active war going on, and the war for your soul is the war for your success in this life. And if you want to debate that with me, first put together seven consecutive days of happiness in your life, then come talk to me. If you can't put seven days in a row where you're up and not down, you're above only and not beneath, where you, where you take thoughts captive and you dismiss them, where, where you're not having to apologize for words that you said or thoughts that you thought, if you can't put seven days in a row, don't come tell me that you got your life together. You can't even be happy. What is the value of that kind of faith? 
Glory to God. Well, I tell you, the Holy Spirit doesn't just want to let go of that, I guess. Who goes first? Who gets to be first? Pick me, pick me, I want to go first. Now, that, that might be a, a little game in life, but you know when you're self-centered, you're always thinking about what pleases you, so your prioritizing is developed around your senses. Your prioritizing is developed around your senses. One of the most vital periods of life is the first three years of life. They're, 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 they're just amazingly vital. And, and the longer I live and observe, uh, the, the, the more I am startled, startled absolutely by the fact that, that 30-year-old, 40-year-old, 50-year-old, 60-year-olds are still living out of attitudes that were trained into them and planted into them in the first three years of their life. Do you know that no baby coming out of the womb and learning to eat, do you know no baby wants sweets? Do you know why sugar is put in baby food? Has nothing to do with the baby, but when they began to pack it, beech nut and others began to package uh, their things in bottles, they realized that moms would heat up the bottles and moms would taste the peas. And moms didn't like the taste of the peas. The sugar was put in the peas so the moms would like it. And what you did, therefore, is you brought up a generation of children where you started injecting sugar into baby food, and we have an epidemic in America, epidemic of sugar addiction. It is a drug. It is a drug. And, and, and again, I, I don't want to get off on that. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to wake you up to something. Uh, you know, that, that, see, the devil raised generations of parents poisoning their children because the devil had already poisoned the parents. Come on. Children, babies, do not grow up racially prejudiced. Racial prejudice has got to be learned. It's got to be taught. It's taught by, it's not that somebody sits down and says, I'm going to teach you about how bad other people is. It's the thousands of conversations, the raised eyebrows, the oh, look. When somebody of another race is mentioned, that communicates to a child, and a child develops racial prejudice, and when it's in there, it is extremely challenging to get it out. The issue in the Middle East is far deeper than people think it is. Because children are trained in the Middle East from infants up to think of Jews as, and Christians as people who need to be killed and trained that the best goal in their life would be to blow themselves up. That is satanic. That is satanic. And when mullahs come up and encourage their people to have their children blow themselves, you are of Satan. Don't think that Islam is some other alternative to Yahweh. Islam is satanic at its roots. Not politically correct. You want to tune me off, go ahead. It's the truth. We sang it today. Our God sacrificed himself. Allah demands that people sacrifice their children. Read your history. That's the God Molech. Glory to God. Now, how do you get that out? Do you educate it out? Do you just say, okay, we're going to teach you that all people are equal? Once that hatred is in there, now it can get out, but it's not easy. How do we get it out of you? And the only way we get it out of you is by bringing the word of God to you that week after week opens up another little facet of your brain and you say, oh my, I got to readjust my thinking. I got to readjust my thinking. Prioritizing your life is one of the greatest challenges in living a full, abundant, happy, and satisfying life. It is. People cannot live their life being happy because they don't know how to prioritize. You know, you can have all the money in the world, it's not going to make you happy. By the way, you can be poor, and, and that's not going to make you happy either. It's not in the circumstances, but it's in the ability to prioritize uh, the things in your life. There is a tyranny of time. 
And yet, you know, the truth is, all of us have the same amount of it. The clock went by midnight last night, and I got 24 hours in this day to live. Or to think Jewishly, last night as the sun went down, a new day began until the sun goes down tonight. This is Shabbat. I have as much of Shabbat as you have of Shabbat. I don't get more hours in my Shabbat. I get in my Shabbat what you get. But what I invest in that Shabbat is what I'm going to get out of it. And if I invest everything Yahweh says to invest in it, then I'm going to get all that he intends. There are conflicting demands on your time and attention. I'm amazed that people who don't have a job, who, who, who sit around all the time and I'll ask them about doing something, they say, well, I don't know if I have time. You know, I... You know, there's certain people. You know, when, when Scott calls me and I'm talking with Scott, he says, hey, Dad, how are things going? By the way, he just got back. He and Tanya from a, a two-week vacation in uh, Scotland. And it's, I think it's the first vacation they've probably had in seven or eight years, so good for them. Good for them. But when he calls me, he says, hey, Dad, how are things going? And, and, you know, I've been tempted in the past. I said, well, you know, I'm pretty busy. And then I realized, you don't use the word busy around Scott Long. You know, compared to his schedule, I'm lazy. <laughs> no, no, it's not that I'm lazy, and it's not that he's busy. It's that I prioritize differently than he prioritizes. Come on. I, I've often wondered how there's men of God who do to an amazing amount of things. They write books. They, they fly around the country speaking. They pastor multiple churches. They do. You know, where do they get the time from? Well, they have the same amount of time that, that I have. Glory to God. I, I remember when this church first started and I'm pastoring the church, but at the same time, I'm working a full-time job uh, in the high-tech world. Come on. And, and so I'm, you know, I got 40 hours a week. I owe the company plus probably 10 hours of commuting. So I got, I got 50 hours a week that, that are sunk into that. And, and, and I don't care how big or small a church is, there's time. You know, it doesn't take less time to prepare a sermon for a, a congregation of 40 than it does of 40,000. You, you don't think that Bishop Oyedo, who has 100,000 people in his congregation tomorrow, 100,000, do you really think he spends more time preparing his message than I did this one? I don't think so, because you know what? He's got to administer that whole complex of uh, 100,000 people. I mean, he's got his plate is full. Come on, come on. You know, just because just it's smaller doesn't, there's certain things it doesn't, come on. You know, one man can only counsel so many people. I found out if you have a, if you have a, uh, you know, 500 people in a congregation, you might be able to counsel 10, 20 people a week. Well, if you have a congregation of, of, of 40, you still can counsel 10 or 20 people a week. And it's not as smaller, you only have one. Well, wait a minute, we're a small congregation. You know what, what, what? I should only have one phone call a week. Come on. Percentage wise, compared to a week, well, then I should be getting one phone call a week. Donna should be getting one phone call a week. What is this 10 phone calls a day? Huh? Come on. Come on. I'm, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to, to show you something that, that you know, you, you, whether it's small or big, you've got to prioritize. And if you don't have time, the problem is you don't know how to prioritize. We all have time. Glory to God. What about conflicting demands on your money? Hmm. Everybody wants your money, especially the bill collectors. Come on. And, and, and most people manage their budget uh, trying to somehow or other work through the conflicting demands of money. I had a friend of mine. He, he got regular raises. He was a lawyer. He was doing very well. And every year he got significant raises. He never balanced his checkbook. I don't recommend this. But, and, and I really can't quite imagine being in, the, in that kind of a state. Well, I can't imagine it, so that means if I can imagine it, God can do more. But what he would do is, you know, is that he'd have a checking account, and, and, and all his, his pay got put into the checking account, and he just went about life charging, paying, charging, paying, you know, and he never balanced his checkbook. What he did is, at the end of every two years, he shut down that checkbook. He opened a new account had all the money start going in there, and he waited for three months because he figured at the end of three months, every check that could clear would clear, 
And then he'd go down to the first account and he'd say, how much money's in there? Oh, you got $78,000 in there. Good, put it in my new account. <laughs> See, the money was coming in faster than it was going out. I, I, boy, I know that stretches your thinking. Okay, come on. That's the way it should be, by the way. Come on. Come on. But, but the reality for most people, and for most of us at some point in our life, we've had that. See, I don't care how, how uh, well off you are, for most of us, we can look back on our life and we've had experiences where it wasn't that way. I don't count pennies anymore. I used to, literally. Every day I sat down, looked at my budget, took all the money out of my pocket, counted it, tried to put my receipts, what did I spend? And I'd say, I'm, I'm off five cents somewhere. I mean, to me that seems so strange now. But literally I did that. What did I spend five cents on? You know, it's like, you, you know, and because and I, I did not want to write in the book, error, five cents, off, five cents. I mean, I just, you know, and so I did that. You know, now, now I get in the habit, I, I, I just say I prioritize. I have a limit on how long I'm going to spend with my checkbook. And, 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 and I'd love to tell you, I'm good at math, and I, boy, when it hits it right, I love it. When the bank and me and my, my money account uh, on, on the computer, when they all line up, Donna will tell you, I dance in the kitchen. Yeah, great. Only took me half an hour, and it's all done. Church books, my book, everything came out right to the penny. Yeah. Well, how much time are you willing to spend on that? See, I'm not going to let the, the enemy jerk me around about that. And I've come to the point where if you look at it, it uh, if you were to look at my accounting, you'd see a line item called ESP. ESP does not mean I'm, I'm spending money on extrasensory perception. <laughs> ESP in my checkbook means error someplace. <laughs> and, and, and I'll, you know, I, I last month the, 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 the checkbook balanced, so it's got to be within this one month. I'm only looking at 30 days. How can you mess it up in 30 days? But I have found myself, well, I can't balance it within the 30 days, so I got, go back 60, 90 days, which is ridiculous. I already had done that. So you'll see ESP, $146.13. I mean, it's like that's got to be a bill or something. I mean, is there an electric bill I forgot or what? I don't know. That sounds like that. But, you know, but I just put ESP and just write it, you know, why? My time is more valuable than trying to find that out, Okay. Now, that's because Yahweh provides for me. I'm not at the penny counting stage. Now, I'm not yet at the stage where I could say, error someplace, $2,338. But I could conceive of someone who said, I don't know where it went, 2300 you know, error someplace, let, let alone 10000 or $1 million, I misplaced a million dollars. You laugh at it, our government has never been audited because if they're audited, they're going to find out there are billions of dollars on account of unaccounted. They don't know where billions went. They don't know where it went. Glory to God. Anyway, I didn't want to go down there either, but I'm, I, I need to get to some place. Help me get there. Come on. Pull on me to get there. Listen, if you do not prior, prioritize, then the loudest voice, the mo most pressing now demand, the, the most urgent gets your attention. That's why bill collectors call you over and over and over again. They're very aware, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, you haven't paid your bill, you're 30 days behind. You know, and, 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 and well, then why don't they wait another month? No, they're going to call you next week. And next week, you know why? They know that if you're behind on their bill, you're behind on other people's bills. And they know that the bill collector who bugs you the most is most likely to get paid. That's just a fact of life. Okay, so they're going to call you if need be every day, if need be several times a day. Why? They know that the loudest voice gets your attention. That may not be the bill if you're behind that you need to pay, but you pay it just to get them off your back. Come on, are, are you listening to me? See, if you don't know how to prioritize, then the loudest voice is what gets the priority. Saying yes to one thing necessitates saying no to something else. You might want to write that down. Saying yes to one thing means you have to say no to something else. If you're not prepared to say no to one thing, then your yes is going to get you in trouble. When I'm working with people's budget, 
You know, I, I, I try to help people understand that once you have a budget, it's, it's easy. The budget dictates your life, not you. And now husband and wife don't need to fight. We're not fighting over the budget because it's the budget that says we can't afford that. Now, it's very simple. If you've got the money, you can do it, but what are you going to do without? Let me, let, me, let me put that where the rubber meets the road. You, you may be able to say, I want to go to Israel in the summer of 2019. We're planning our next trip for that. But when you look at your budget, you can go to Israel in 2019, or you can go to the beach this summer, continue to take little mini vacations, go on, on, on little jaunts here and there, go out to eat and do all these things. But you can't do both. You can't do both. And, and if, if you're not a prioritize, then you simply say that. Gee, I'd love to go to the beach or I'd love to go out to eat, but my budget is a lot allocated the money to go to Israel. Otherwise, what happens? You come the next year and you ate your Israel trip. You spent the time at the beach instead of your Israel trip. Now, you still want to go to Israel, so then what do you do? You borrow the money. Now you're digging a deeper hole. All because you couldn't learn to say no to your flesh here. I can't tell you how many people have lived 10, 15 years of their life squandering $500 a month on fun things to do and 15 years later look back and say, if I had put that $500 a month into a savings account, I would have the down payment for my house. They fund their house. They vacationed their house. That's a lack of the ability to prioritize. Are, 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 we, in the, are we on the same page? I, some of you are getting quiet. Is this beginning to meddle with you? <laughs> so here's the question for today. It took me all that to get to the question. The question for the day is, who or what gets first claim on your life? And the message of the kingdom of God, and we read it earlier in Matthew 6, is seek first the kingdom. And all these other things get added. So Yahweh has one description of priorities in life. And Yeshua taught that as well. You seek the kingdom of God first. And then everything else will be added to you. So in Matthew 22, we have a, an interesting thing. Let, let, let me explore it for a moment. Uh, a, a focus that Yeshua brought to light. In Matthew 22, an expert in the law tested Yeshua with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Come on, you have 613 commandments, positive and negative ones. Which one's the greatest? Yeshua replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Actually, that's not what he said. What he said was, ve'ahavta Yahweh Eloheka bekol levavka uvekol nafshika uvekol meodeka. But if he came and said that to you now, you'd say, what? <laughs> so that's why we have a translation. Ve'ahavta means you shall love. Comes from the, the Hebrew word for love. Ve'ahavta means you shall love. Yahweh, the Lord, the proper name of God, the, God, the name by which he says, this is my name. Ve'ahavta Yahweh Eloheka. Eloheka comes from Elohim, which means your God. Yahweh, your God. Who is your God? Yahweh is my God. Pharaoh says to Moses, who, who is, who is t telling me I need to do this? Yahweh. Who is this Yahweh? I don't know of a Yahweh. I know of Ra. I know of uh, Osiris. I know of all these other gods. But who is Yahweh? I don't know Yahweh. Come on. Yahweh is your God. That's my God. You know, there was a movement years ago called God is Dead. We're beyond God. We don't need God anymore. And I saw a bumper sticker one day that was going around saying, 
you know, God is dead. Well, all of a sudden, this other bumper sticker started popping up in places saying, my God is alive, sorry about yours. <laughs> my God is alive and well. My God is alive and well. Glory to God. Ve'ahavta Yahweh Eloheka. You must love the Lord your God. Bakol. Bakol means with all. With everything you've got. Bakol. Lavavka, which is your heart. Lavav is your heart. The coal of Afka with all of your heart. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And Uve Kol and the with all Nafshika from Nafesh, which is your soul. Your soul is how we identify you. It's your mind, your feelings, and emotions. You are a spirit being. You have a soul. That is your mind, feelings, and emotions. You live in a body. You are not your body. Don't let your body tell you what to do. You tell your body what to do. Come on. I live in my body. It's my earth suit. Lose my earth suit and I leave earth. It's required for living on this planet. It's an earth suit. But that's all it is. It's an earth suit. I'm also... <laughs> I'm also uh, not my soul. That is the expression of personality. Feelings, mind, and emotions is not who I am. I am a spirit. And we are meant to have our spirit, man, control the soul. But Christians are defeated because the soul and the body control the spirit. That's a whole message in and of itself. Not going to go there. So you shall, Ve'ahavta Yahweh Eloheka Bakol with all your Lavavka Uve Kol and with all your Nafshika, your soul, and with all Uve Kol Meodeka, Meod. And Meod means strength, force, abundance. It literally means muchness. Muchness. So I am to love the Lord, you know, my God, with, with all my, uh, my spirit man, obviously, but, but with all my inner man, with all my soul, with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my muchness. Whatever my muchness is. If you got a lot of money, you got a lot of much, muchness to worship God with. And you're expected to. Come on. You know, Bill Gates' parents were the ones that told him one time that it is immoral for him to have that kind of money and not give it away. Now, he wasn't being a selfish person. He was just busy building the, one of the largest businesses in the world. I think Jeff Bezos has beat him now. I think Jeff Amazon has more money now than, than even Bill Gates. But, but uh, anyway, uh, Bill's parents told him, you know, it, it is not more. This, did, I, as far as I know, this didn't come out of a Christian value system. But it's just not moral to have, you know, he would have been like the eighth largest country in the world. He alone. <laughs> you're, not to, you're not meant to have billions and billions and billions and billions for you. I mean, you spend it, buy everything you want, but billions and billions sooner or later, there's nothing left to buy. You own the planet, what else can you buy? You can have as many starships as you want. You can have mansions that are bigger than palaces, but, but the money st st still comes in. The Sultan of Brunei, when he bought his first 707 from Boeing, showed up for the closing. His pilots there, they're going to fly his, you know, multi, multi, multi-million dollar, you know, precision-built jet with all the interior and gold and mahogany and all that. And he shows up for the, for the, the closing of the deal and everything, and and the finance guy from Boeing says, we're expecting. He says, okay, you know, sign here, and the bank's going to take everything. He says, the sultan reaches in his pocket and pulls out his personal checkbook and writes out a, I don't know, $300, $400 million check out of his personal checkbook. Boeing said, we have never sold a jet paid by a check from a person. Never, ever. You know, oh, maybe I'll buy two. You know, I got enough in here to buy two, three. But what happens when... You know, you can only use so many jets at the same time. You know, find the Sultan of Brunei has 76 or 86, something like that, cars. 
you know, and, and, the, and the building, the house it in, and, you know, 32 bedrooms and 42 bathrooms and whatever else like that. But the money still keeps coming in. Because Brunei is just oil rich, and, and he owns it all. So it keeps coming in. Well, they, so Bill's parents said, no, you got to start giving it away. And now there's billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, being channeled that way. He, he's serving God with his muchness. You worship God with your, you say, well, I don't have money. But, but you got you got joy you can give. So if you're a happy person, then be happy. My muchness is, I'm here, you're glad I'm here. Hi, I'm so-and-so, you're glad to meet me, aren't you? Yeah, come on. You should be. If you're not, by the time we're done, you'll be glad you met me. I'm serving God with my muchness. You know, you, you know we get stuffed with the word of God and then we don't share the word. Wait a minute, you got muchness of word in you. You need to be serving God with your muchness. That's not where I'm going with all. This is all beginning. Ha, oh, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's move on. All right. So in Deuteronomy chapter 10, what, what actually, let, let me back up. It, in, in Matthew, when, when he said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The NET Bible says you must love the Lord your God with your whole mind, your whole being, and all your strength. Amplified, you shall love the Lord your God with your mind and heart and your entire being with all your might. Contemporary Jewish Bible, you're to love Adonai your God with all your heart, all your being, and all your resources. Come on. Message Bible, you're to love God you, love God, your God, with your whole heart. Love him with all that's in you. Love him with all you've got. Glory to God. So we're going to talk about prioritizing. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 16. Yahweh, your God, commands you this day to follow these decrees and laws. Carefully observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have declared this day that Yahweh is your God and that you will walk in his ways, that you will keep his decrees, commands, and laws, and that you will obey him. Let me just stop there. Holy Spirit, this, this is what has been lost in the church. Listen, when they came to God, they made a pledge. They declared that you're my God and I will keep your decrees, commands, and laws and I will obey you. Now we say you can come to Yeshua and nobody says, and you need to promise him something. We, we wrap it up in this phrase that has become emotional porridge called, you know, you love him. I, I, I gave my life. Wait a minute. The Bible from beginning to end and Yeshua said it even in the book of Revelation. He comes back and says to the church, you're missing it. You're not doing what I commanded you. But what we say is, say this prayer, accept Jesus as your Lord. Well, a, what, tell him what it means. To say, I receive you as my Lord, says you're my king, I will obey what you say. If you're not willing to obey him, don't lie. Ananias and Sapphira lied and dropped dead in the house of God. Because they said, oh, this is all the money. We gave it all to God, but they kept some from themselves. They could have kept it. It was theirs. They could have said, we brought 80% of it to you, and we kept 20%. But they lied. They said, they said they were totally committed, but they were not, and they dropped dead. Maybe there would be a soberness in the body of Christ if all of a sudden people raised their hand and said prayers, and one-third of them dropped dead right there on the aisle. I'm not advocating that. But, but the fault isn't theirs. The fault is the preacher that will not tell them that if he's your Lord, you're, gonna, you're saying to him, I will obey you. I will do what you say. You're God, not me. This isn't a free lunch. There are no free lunches in life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Where was I? Verse 17, that's out of my notes. You have declared this day that the Lord is your God. I've said, Yeshua, you're my Lord. Yahweh, you're my God. And that you will walk in his ways. You'll keep his decrees, commands, and laws. You'll obey him. And the Lord has declared this day, 
Remember, we're talking covenant. Oh, I'd love to teach on that. A covenant. You've said, you'll be my God, I'll obey you. And I've said, the Lord has declared that you are his people. I think that's a great exchange. But he goes on, his treasured possession and that you are to keep his command. In other words, he says, you have pledged yourself to me, I pledge myself to you. We want the pledge of him to us without giving him the pledge of us to him. Doesn't work. That's why you're living a religious life but not a victorious life. That's why you've got Christianity but you can't put seven days together happy. Because you're living a rebellious life. You're, you're not living under the king, you're living in rebellion to the king. Ah, glory to God. Now, hang with me because we're going somewhere. Because I'm going to share something with you that I trust is going to uh, open your eyes and understanding, and that is there's got to be priorities. So what is the priority? As a young Christian, as I began to be taught about, you know, who's first in your life and things, and then as I got into, into seminary and to become a pastor and all this, I, I developed a pecking order. Do you know what a pecking order is? It comes out of the barnyard where, you know, they, the roosters and the hens all establish their pecking order. They peck at each other. I peck better than you, so you better submit to me because I can peck you. They peck at each other. And so they establish, this is the head, this is a head hen, this is the next one. They, they have an order. And, you know, those guys who get paid money to study that, which is kind of weird, say, well, that's number one, that's number 13. In other words, there's 12 ahead of him. If he ever wants to get to the top, he's got to overcome 12 others before he can be the head pecker. Come on. Now that you, so you get a barnyard, and it's all nice. Everything's fine. And what you do is you go to another barnyard, and you get, a, you get a chicken or a rooster or hen that's at the top of the list. You take them, and you come into the, and you throw them in there. And now you have chaos. You have pecking going on all day long, all week long, because now we've got to reestablish the order. I think it was... Uh, uh, Brother Hagen talks about this little boy the first day of school and, and, and he's uh, going around with this, a, a pad of paper. He says, what's your name? Oh, Pastor Shad. Okay, Pastor Shad. Okay, you know, what's your name? Scott Robes. Okay, Scott Robes. And he comes up and says, what's your name? He says, well, what are you doing? I'm, I'm writing a list of all the guys that I can beat up. And he says, you can't beat me up. Oh, okay, I'll take your name off the list. See, sometimes the, the devil just puts you on his list and you allow it. Hey, you can't do that to me. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'll take your name off my list. That's free. I'll just throw that one in there for you. Glory to God. So, so he, here's the list. Who's number one? Not a, not a difficult question. It's not meant to be a difficult question. Who's number one? Pastor, come on. You're going to go out. You're going to be a pastor. You're going to be successful. You got to get your priorities right because if you don't, by the way, when you go into a church as a pastor, who thinks they're number one? The congregation. They do. They absolutely do. The board of deacons, they think they're number one. They can tell you what to do. They have first claim on your life. That's what they think. Come on. And so, so uh, you're going to learn who's number one. Settle it. God is number one. Right? We all in agreement. God's number one. Who's number two? Now, if you're married, who's number two? Your spouse. Now, I, I'd love to get off and teach on this, but I'm, I'm teaching something else. Remind me someday, maybe after lunch, we'll, we'll do a teaching at a, at a more family level. But, but, but number two is your spouse. It's not God and the church. It's God and then my spouse. Second priority. Who's number three? Children. Absolutely. It's not God, children, and spouse. By the way, in that, in that answer there is the explanation of why many marriages are like this. And the fact that the children have risen to second place isn't what caused it. It's evidence that the relationship with spouse was broken, and so now the investment gets put in the children. So anyway, so I have this clear understanding. Number one is God is first. He's got the first claim on my life. Second is 
My spouse has my that's the second claim. Third is children. Fourth is your work, your job. If you're a pastor of a church, it's it's the church. If you work at HP like I did, it's HP. And, and so the priority is God, and then spouse, and then children, and then HP. Have you got that? I love these push around things. It makes me look strong, doesn't it? Look at that. Just, <laughs> man. Mm. Glory to God. Let me see. I, I, I need a God. Pastor Shad, would you come up and stand on the platform here? Just walk around. Stand. You can be God today. Only today. Actually, only for the sermon. Only, only then. So, so here's God. And, and that's my first priority. That's the first priority in life. I, I decree and I declare that God is my first priority in life. And, and, uh, and I owe my allegiance to him. He, he's got first claim on everything I do. Okay? Well, that goes without saying, who's second? Do I have a wife over here? Yeah. Miss Donna. Miss Donna, can I ask you to come up here? First lady of the church. She does not like it when I call her up here, but I like her outfit today. She bought that, in, that top in Israel when we were there. And, 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 yeah, right. And, and, and so, I have a wife. Hi, That's Yahweh. God. Abba. <laughs> <laughs> I never know what I'm going to get when I ask her to come up here. You know, she, she might preach or, you know, she, that's a risk I take. And, and so, this is my second priority in life. Okay? And, you see, Jordan's on the camera. Oh, I'm going to make you my child. And you start smiling right away. Because you're a child anyway. All right, so, so here's my children. Okay? And then, let me see. I, I, Scott, you can, be, you can be the work. You're the job. You're my coworker. You stand right over there. You're my coworker. Okay? I'm right over here. Okay? We'll get a little ascending thing here. Okay? And, and, and so here's what we say. I've got, I've got it figured out. Yahweh is first in my life. And, and my wife is second in my life, and my children are third in my life, and my job is fourth in my life, right? How do we live that out? Yahweh, it's, it's Sabbath or Sunday, whenever I'm worshiping, and, and, and I'm going to give you the day. Well, actually... I know you're first in my life, but you know you know how busy I am. Look at all I got to do. I, I'm going to give you one hour, maybe two, and 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 so I come into the house of Yahweh. Now I'm talking where most Christians are. When are they God conscious? Other than a moment here or there, they're they're God conscious on their day of worship, on the day of worship, and, and even by the way, then they're not always God conscious. J just as an aside, I had a had a. A staff leader's wife years ago in a church when I had a multi staff with me. And we'd be in the middle of, I used to have the staff sitting up on the, on the platform, the men and the wives. And, and we'd be in the middle of worship, and somebody would come in. The congregation was maybe three, four hundred people. And, and somebody would walk in the back, and this, this woman, we're praising God, would suddenly go, You know, and, and, and no matter what was said, she didn't change it, so I had them all sit down. It, it, it's like we're saying, God, you're first, and you can't even stay plugged into worship. Who just came in? I don't know about you, but if I'm talking to you, and you keep looking out the window, that sooner or later, I'm thinking, are you expecting somebody? Am, am I that boring that you don't want to be with me? That's very rude. We're just rude with God. We're rude with God. We come into his presence and sing, and then we wonder who's here. I wonder who's singing off key. I wonder. Anyway. So, but you're first. I want you to know you're first. God, Abba, it's good to be friendly with you and everything. It's good. I got to go now. You know, it's, it's, it's one o'clock, and the sermon went a little longer. And actually, I got to mow my lawn this week. But, but I'll, I'll catch you next week, Abba. <laughs>
And what do I do? I don't, I don't even get to the door and turn around and say, Bye, Abba. It's been good being with you. Come on. Re religion has, has got us so brainwashed, I don't even know what I did. Right. I'm not even conscious of the fact that I sat in his presence and walked out the door and didn't even say goodbye. I'm entertained, I'm in my mind, I'm doing all kinds of things, but I say I want a deeply personal relationship with God Almighty and he's offering a deeply personal relationship and I'm not even at a human level sensitive enough to say goodbye. I'm not conscious that, that, that at three in the afternoon and whenever I finally go home, that from the day I, the moment I walked out that door at 12, 12.30, 1 o'clock, whenever I walked out that door, I haven't even thought about him. And I'm still in his building. But he's first in my life. Or is he? And so what happens? Been good to be with you, Yahweh. My wife needs some attention. You know, I've just been busy lately, and I need to spend some attention with her. And and you you get in place. Come on, you you know you're not you're not mom's first and our first. You know, you, mom's first or dad's first. You're second. You know, and we come first. Sorry, you don't get to go with us on this trip. Okay, okay, okay. And and so now we go off. Where's God? Abba. Good fault. Hey. It's a man. It's a man you gave me. It's the, it's man, the man you gave, you gave me. me. It's the man you gave me. We we need some time. You know Yahweh does matter. We we need time. Uh, we, let's go to the beach. La di da da. Let's walk in the water and have fun. You know. Let's go have some fried, not fried, some baked salmon. Let let let's let's just have a great time at the beach. And where's Yahweh? Oh, Yahweh's first. Well, where is he? Well, he's first. Where, where is he? What happened? How did second obliterate first? How did second obliterate first? So, so when we're in our family relationship, that's what happens. Now, <laughs> you always getting more distant there. <laughs> I'm a family man. Come on, let's go. You know, Randy told me that that uh, he was talking with a, some uh, a group of adults going through just reminiscing on their childhood and and the thing, the importance their parents had meant to them and things like this. And he he started telling the most significant thing growing up with me is I'd take him to the dump. <laughs> if I had known that the most significant thing was taking him to the dump, why did I pay for that vacation? Why did I buy him those toys? You know, he didn't mention any of the toys. He probably, I don't know if he even remember. He didn't mention one toy that I gave him. He remembered how I would go to the dump, say, Randy, come to the dump with me. You know, and, he just get, and we'd go there, and he'd, he'd help me throw stuff in, into the landfill and everything. And he went on and on about how important he felt, and he's with his dad doing what, what's important to his dad and, and things like that. Wow. That's a whole other story we'll talk about later. So let's go to the dump together. We're going to the dump together. You see those trees over? You see that? I'm talking. I'm being a good dad, you know. You know, dad, why is the grass green? Because it's got chlorophyll in it, you know. Uh, and we're, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? We're having all these conversations. Uh, uh, who's first in your life? Um, um, are Yahweh's first in my life. Where is he in your relationship with your children? Um, been to the dump all year, never once talked about God. Went out and rode bicycles together, but we never stopped in the middle of biking together. And I had a conversation with him about how important Yahweh is to me. Come on. Come on, parents. God is first in our life, but we don't even talk to our children about him except in little sound bites. When we want to discipline them, God wouldn't like that. God's watching you. 
When do we ever share our personal relate? We just said God's the most important person in my life. What do they see? What they see is a mom or a dad who never talks about God in their life. So what you've communicated is he's not first in your life, and then you add hypocrisy to it because they hear you in church say, yes, God's first, but they say, but he's not. I live with you all day long in the house, and I never see you pray, and we never read the Bible together, and you never talk about God in the house. I hear you get to church, and you say, oh, God's first, 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 but I live with you, and he's not. My children, they're important. Would never miss a little league game, but I might have to miss church. You're first, God, but you know, I can't come this week because my son has a soccer game. Uh, God, I know there's, I, Yahweh, I know you have a Moed. Mary Francis is coming, and Pastor told us we should all go, but it's my son's birthday, and we want to celebrate his birthday. And come on, you know, family's important, God. And yet you have the audacity to say that God is first. And then, the biggie. The elephant in the room. Kind of an oxymoron. To, yeah, I should have chosen some. Yeah, he's the biggest one there. Yahweh, I want you to know you're first in my life. Uh, it's, it's Monday, I got to go to work. You know, wife is second. In, in my life, I make sure, mm, mm -hmm. see you, honey, love you, got to go. Oh, oh, you're third, I got to give you a hug, give you a hug. Okay, bye, love you guys. I get, I, I get in my car, turn it on, and pull out into the street. By the time in the, I'm in the street, I am not thinking of first, I'm not thinking of second, I'm not thinking of third, I'm thinking already of what I've said is fourth. The company doesn't pay me for my mind share commuting. I show up at 8 and I leave at 5. Or I show up at 9 or whatever your hours are. They don't pay me for my thought life when I leave my house in Hubbardston and drive to Westford. But how did they get my time? And what happened to my first, second, and third priorities? So not only does my work get 40 hours of work, they get my commute time. And then after I have supper, I need to get on my email to see what went on at work. I go on vacation to be with my second and third, and this guy shows up. <laughs> now, now, now I'm, I'm trying to make this humorous, but I'll tell you, underneath of it, friends, this is killing the church. It is killing the church, and it's why you can't live successfully. Why am I passionate about it? Because our priorities are wrong, but it's robbing us. It's killing us. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I just love it, you know, when you got these, these shy people who don't take over your illustration. <laughs> Number four. Hey, good to see you, Scott. How was your weekend? You, great, great. You know, uh, you, you going to that meeting I'm going to? Yeah, okay, I'll see you there. Let's go get some co let's go get some coffee together. Boom, boom, boom. We walk and we chit and chat, and maybe we're talking about the ball game or one on one on the weekend. More than likely in some work situation, we're talking about work already. Did you get that memo and such and such? We get our coffee, we go, we sit in a meeting, you know, he sits down next to me. We chit chat, we chit chat. I never talk to him about my number one. I may not talk to him about number two. I may not talk to him about number three. No, but he and I, we're great buddies. We talk, you know. He comes, sticks his head in my office. Hey, you got a moment? I want to ask you something here. Or he says, hey, it's lunchtime. You want to join us? We're all going down to the cafeteria. So we get all our buddies together. And we sit down in the cafeteria. What happened to my number one? You're number one, but by the way, I'm not going to say a prayer over my food because these are pagans, they wouldn't understand it. Hope you understand. Let's start eating. Come on. 
Where, where, where does my number two show up in any of my conversations? In my case, it did all the time. See, I was with guys in the workplace. I never knew if they had a wife or not. I never knew if they had children or not. But I remember the first time I brought Donna to one of the workplaces. I worked there for about two years. Everybody in, in, in the entire team, when they heard Donna was coming up to the office for, uh, for a minute, they all got out of their offices. Donna! Boom! They all gave her hugs. It's like, you guys, when did you meet my wife? They never met her. Or they had met her. Her picture's on, on my desk. Uh, my children's pictures are on the... Jordan, they all knew Jordan. A absolutely amazing. You know, if you got me, you got number two and number three. Did you get number one? Some of you are good at number three. Oh, hi, how are you? Yeah, great. Oh, yeah, I haven't met you before. You get chit-chat and everything. Oh, do you have any children? You get three. The reason you asked if they had children was because you wanted to show them yours. You didn't ask them because you really wanted to know about their children. You know, let me tell you about my children and grandchildren. <laughs> and out, come, out comes the list, okay? Why? Be because my identity, why do we do this? Because my identity is wrapped up in my children. I have value because I'm a parent. I have value because of my children. I want to talk about my children. Okay? And, and, and it's not, not that it's wrong to talk about ch children, but think what happens. My identity's here. If I'm not talking about my spouse, oh, we got a problem, don't we? Because I, I, I'm not putting my identity with my spouse. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's right. And he said, without her, there though. wouldn't be me. Yeah, that's there's right. Okay? And, 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 and so, uh, but so my identity is there. When you ask most women, tell me something about yourself. Interestingly, even a lot of professional women, though the longer they've been a professional woman, the less has happened. Tell me about yourself. Well, I'm a mother of five children. Statistics show that women identify themselves first by their children. Hmm? Not, well, I'm a nuclear scientist. You know why? Nuclear scientists gives you nothing but status in a world that's going to end. Okay? Now, you ask a, a, a man, by the way, tell me something about yourself. Well, I, you know, I work at HP. I'm a product manager. I've got, got friends, Scott, a lot of guys here. I can tell you a lot about, about them, what's going on in their life. You have any children? Yeah, well, I, I have a child over here, Josiah. Yeah, well, what's going on in his life? Um, um, well, what grade's he in? Um, I, I, well, he's, he's homeschooled. I, I, I think it's, well, I, I'm not sure what grade he is. He, he's in some, oh, what's his favorite subject? Um, I, 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 think it's, I think it's math. What's Scott's favorite subject? Building things. I, is this giving you a picture? Come on, if I'm giving you a picture, I'm not succeeding. You can get, get in your place work. <laughs> You're first. You're second. And, and you understand, I'd put you first, but if you're, if you're not a believer, that, that presents a challenge. What do you mean he's first? One man, his wife gave his life to the Lord. His wife gave her life to the Lord. And after about a year, she, she's living faithfully as a Christian. She's involved in a, in a woman's group that's really trying to teach her how to be a good Christian wife and everything. And one day, this, this man comes into my pastor's office, Chris Lyons, and he says, I give up. So what do you mean you give up? He says, my wife's having an affair with another man, and how can I compete? He's God. <laughs> <laughs> okay? And, and they're number three. But in the bulk of the week, I'm spending the bulk of my time here. Now, now be careful. I'm not saying... You shouldn't spend the time here. If the company's paying you for 40 hours, they should get 40 hours. Okay? But here's where we got it mixed up. Ah, I heard this, this last week and it was like, ah! There is no number two, three, and four. There's only number one. 
And as long as you say there's a two, three, and four, you're going to spend your life trying to juggle competing things. Well, you know, I know I, I, I want to go to that church meeting, but, but my, my spouse will be upset if I do. They say I go to church too much. So, so you're having a battle you shouldn't have. Or, or I, I know my wife wants time, but my children need time. And, and then the work, the boss at work is really demanding. And, and so you're like this. And in the midst of being like this, why it is like that and why it drives you crazy and why it puts stress on your body and why it messes up your life is because the answer is there's only a number one. And if all of this becomes a part of number one, it balances. But when you try to think, well, he's one, but this is two, three, and four, you're trying to juggle these, and the one that gets the short run is number one, but now you feel guilty. And now when you go to say, I need from God, I need healing from God, I, I want blessings from God, you've undercut your own spirit because the devil says, you don't even think about him. And yeah, well, that's right. And so here you are trying to stand as a woman or man of faith, but the devil is convicting you because in the juggling of life, you say he's one, but you know he's not. And the answer is very simple. He's number one, and there is no number two. Now, what does that mean? Are, are you with me so far? Are you hearing me? When he said that, it was click, boom, ding, adjust, dang, boom, bang, rewrite. Huh. I'd like to be married to you. That would, that would be great. I, I, can't, I just would like to spend the rest of my life with you. But there's something you need to understand. The only way that we're going to be successful in marriage is he, he's got to be part of it. And, and, and so when there's a wedding, what should be very clear is we are coming underneath priority one. He's the only priority in life. Hmm? So, you know what? We 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 we've been busy. Uh, let's go to the beach. We're going to the beach. Come on, come on, Yahweh. You need to stand up. Come on. I'm ready so, to go. Right. So, Amen. whatever you want, I'm ready to go. That's right. So, so it's not that we go doing our thing, but while we're walking on the sand, we're talking. You know what the Lord has done. You know, I was reading a scripture today. You know, ah, oh, yeah, well, that's like this. And so when we're walking down the beach together, when we're doing, when we're out in a, in, at, at, at a restaurant eating together, there's another chair at the table, and he's part of it. That's right. And he's telling us to look to his and, eyes at the people in there, not just at each other. Right. So we're not there, oh, I'm madly in love with you. Or on a phone. Or, well, that's even worse. Yeah, we won't even go there. Oh, no. We won't even but, go there. But, 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 you know, we're very conscious of, of talking about Abba and what he's done for us. We, we spend a lot of time talking about the blessings of how good Abba's been to us. Okay? And now it's not your number two. It's that you and I, us, are tucked up under the priority. Then we have children. And it's like, well, it's soccer day, or it's, let's go to the dump. It's like, Abba, we're going to the dump. Uh, jump in the truck with us. Now we're in the truck, and very consciously, so uh, what's God doing in your life, Josiah? Amazing things. Well, tell me. So he starts telling me about God. I was talking to God the other day. Really? Oh, good. What did he say? How am I going to know what God's saying in his life if we don't have those conversations? And now God sits in the truck with us. And then we're in the middle of a, of a soccer game or a, a hike up the mountain, and, and we have natural conversations, natural conversations. Wow, look at, look at what, from Mount Washington. Wow, look how far you, isn't it amazing that God made all this? I mean, in other words, I'm not having my private little, oh, God's number one in my life, hi, God. No, the priority of children is not anything other than you're my child under God. And, and so now he becomes part of my life. Then we have the more difficult one. What about the workplace? What does the Bible say? Do your work as if you work for God. Hmm? How on earth can I get mad at the company? I don't work for the company. 
Come on. I, I, excuse me. I didn't work for digital. I didn't work for Compaq. I didn't work for HP. I worked for Yahweh. Yahweh gave me an assignment. You know, it was a time when I worked for Manpower. And when I worked for Manpower, they would assign me. We have an assignment for three weeks. You're going to go work with this company. I go there, but I'm working for Manpower. Manpower is paying me. I get a check for Manpower. And they're assigning me. Well, I work for Yahweh. And, and Yahweh assigns me. See, it, you've got to start seeing your job, no matter what it is, as I, I, I don't work for you, I work for God. Now, you don't, doesn't mean you have to go tell people, I don't work for you. But you need to understand that. Because if you don't understand that, this becomes a turmoil. You hear they're having layoffs? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, what, what, what do you think about our group? I, well, I hear that our group's going to be gone. You know, are you looking for another job? I think maybe I ought to be looking for another job. You know, I don't think it's fair. You know, the guys up at the top, they don't get laid off. It's us guys. They never lay those guys off up there, you know. You know, look at the percentage, you know. 1% of management gets laid off. 20% of the workers get laid If it wasn't for the workers, there'd be no company. But the managers, they just said, that's a dead-end conversation. That'll eat your life up. It'll eat your lunch up. But you get caught up in that. But you know what? If I work for God, and he comes, Scott would come say, that and say, well, I'm really not worried. Well, you might get laid off. Oh, I never get laid off. What do you mean you don't get laid off? Well, because I don't work for the company. I work for Yahweh. He, he never lays me off. If the assignment isn't here, he'll have another assignment. Hmm? Glory to God. At the end of the day, you know, all the guys get together and say, hey, listen, we're going to uh, go to the pub for, for a little while after, you know, why don't you stop? I know you don't drink, but just come and, you know, have a water and, and be with us. And I think, I've been with you for eight hours today. I don't want to spend one more minute with you. I, I, I want to get back to my other, the other part of my life here, you know. And, and, uh, but, but see, that's not my identity. That's not my identity. That's not my identity. Too easy to get your identity wrapped up in that. So how do I bring Yahweh there? Well, I talk about him. You know, so that, that when, uh, when I'm sitting down at the table and we're going to have lunch, I said, if you don't mind, I'm going to pray over my food. Yeah, you're going to pray anyway, but come on. You know, it, it's, uh, why? why? Why why do I leave? You know, excuse me. If I thought of this back then, I probably should have put an extra t chair at the table. Don, you know, every time we go out to eat, there's, you know, eight or nine of us. You always put another chair at the table. Yeah, that's for Yeshua. <laughs> that's for Elijah. That's for Yahweh. I always, I always want to make sure he's at the table with us. I wonder if that would change, have changed the conversation at the entire table. People start to say something, look at that empty chair and think, uh-uh, his God's with them. Hmm? Now, by the way, if God is with you enough, that should change the conversation at the table. I, I've had entire conversations change simply because I, I, I joined the table. Not because I said, oh, I don't want to hear that stuff. They knew I, I didn't want to hear that stuff. I never told them that. I don't want to hear any bad jokes. I don't want to hear filthy jokes, and I don't want profanity. I never said that. It's just that I never said any of that stuff. I never laughed at any of that stuff. I never used that language. And they knew I was a Christian. They knew you know, Yeshua was Lord of my life. You know? But I was living a life at a quality of life that they recognized it's not their level. And if every once in a while somebody would slip, they'd apologize. I had a guy swear one time, oh, excuse me, Don. It's like, no, I'm not your Lord. You don't need to apologize to me. You may need to apologize to him. But, but, but what was it? it, it it's that, that if he's first in my life, then he should be here, he should be here, and he should be here. There's only one priority. Seek first the kingdom of God. All the other things will be add, added to you. Now, what's the point of this whole lesson? Thank you. You guys can go be seated. Yeah. Yeah, we all walk out together. <laughs> Prove the point. We're going to all walk out together. Bye. Sermon's over. None. <laughs> Glory to God. Taking God with you. Taking God with you. So we. I'm leading you. I'm showing you the way. And I'm giving you the door. By empty sanctuary, we took God with us. Amen. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Think about it. Now. Let me wrap this up. 
You glad you came? Did you get anything out of that illustration? You know, you know, I, I, I saw that and, and, and began to realize that the, the biggest challenge is when we are saying one thing and living another. And why is that a challenge? Because you're programming your brain not to believe. See, see why your yes should be yes and your no should be no? You're, you're programming yourself so that when you need to speak faith, it doesn't work. And I'm saying, it doesn't work. But I said, I am this. I, my God meets my needs. But your brain doesn't believe you. Because you've trained your brain not to believe you. Your brain hears you lie all the time. It hears you say things you do not mean. It's conditioning your brain to fight the agreement of the Word of God. You know why Donna and I don't ask a lot of people, <laughs> I can't even name people, to get in agreement with us? Because we have little confidence that people's words have enough integrity to agree with them. Hmm? Would you get in agreement with, with, with me to pray about such and such? But you don't even agree with your own prayers. And, and, and I'm going to say, would you get in agreement with me for this financial need? And then you go out and say, pastor has a financial need. Now I go, oh, did you hear? Pastor's in trouble. He needs money. Now, I, I'm, I'm speaking the truth about the body of Christ, I, even in the Word of Faith movement. I do not go to people and say, I want you to get in agreement because they turn it into a rumor and speak the negative. They're on the phone. Oh, yes, pastor, I'm in agreement for your healing. Yes, sister so-and-so, I'm in agreement for your healing. Hang up. God bless you. God will heal you. Hang up. Dial someone. Did you hear that sister and so-and-so has such and such? You foul mouth liar. You just agreed that it was taken care of, and now you're speaking that it isn't taken care of. That's got to stop. That's got to stop in the body of Christ. Okay, so we got, we got to get our priorities straight. So if you say, God, you're first, but then you live as if he's not, you're undercutting your faith, and in the day of adversity, your faith will not work. You're training yourself to either be a success or to be a failure. Now, how can we do that? We take everything in our life and we submit it to the only priority in our life. Everything gets submitted to that priority. I'm sorry, family. No, you, you, you don't, you're, you're not in the pecking order. It's not a pecking order. We all are under God. We do what Yahweh says. Yahweh says we do this. This is what you say. Hmm? Come on. I'm sorry, work, but no. You, you fall under my commitment to Yahweh. For, for me, personally, you know, that, that took on the fact that, you know, once I understood Sabbath, I don't work on Sabbath, period. Are you going to get fired? I've had people told, well, if you can't work on Saturday, you need to resign. No, I never have to resign. If you don't like the fact that I can't work on Saturday, you're going to have to fire me. The onus is on you to fire me, not my onus to say, well, then I'm going to quit. No, I'm very upfront, you know, that, 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 and, and I don't get mad. Well, the state says I have a right to my, that's not it at all. The point is, I'm not going to make it easy for you. We'd like to schedule a meeting such and such a time. Can you fly to California? No, I can't. You know, that's over the high holiday, ho holidays. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be flying at that time. Hmm? I went head to head with a couple of VPs on their expectation of, of workers in, in reference to family, not in faith. We expect that if you're going to be, work down in Texas uh, one week out of the month, you need to be showing up at work at 8 o'clock in Texas, and you work till 5 o'clock on Friday because that's the work week. And I'd say to them, you just asked your employee to commit two days of his personal family time to the company. Not only are you not paying him, that's bad enough that you don't pay him for that time. But not only are you not paying him, you're stealing time from his family. And the company has no right to do that. Well, I, I had a couple of managers, it's, man, they, they looked at me with fire in their eyes. And I said, you're the manager of that group, and you do what you want with that group. All I'm telling you is I think you're wrong. I think you're morally wrong, 
and, and, and I think as a business principle, that's a wrong business principle. Now, you know, if, if my employee wanted to leave on, on Sunday night at 10 o'clock at night and, 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 and fly all night to get somewhere, that's fine. But why should I ask him to give up his whole day? Companies do that, by the way, all, all the time. But when are people going to stand up and say, that's not right? That is not a right principle to grow a business. If you're going to grow a business, you need to be sensitive to the needs of the people. Come on. Are, are you listening to me? Okay. But see, I, I had that belt within me. I started taking Donna to, 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 and Jordan to Texas with me. Now, I couldn't do that every trip I made, but because of flight mileage and everything like that, about every third trip that I made there, I had enough mileage that they could fly free. You know, people, well, the company's, well, the company's paying for my motel room anyway. Excuse me. Doesn't cost them a penny more to have them in the bedroom. I paid for the food, so it didn't cost them any more. That and it cost them nothing. By the way, the rent a car. Well, you know they don't have rent a cars for only one person, so every rent a car I get can take three of us. You know, and, and again, people made assumptions. Oh, he's taking his family at, at 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 the company expense, and I would just explain what I was doing and everything, and 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 quiet them down. Then there were the others who said, "Well, my wife would never want to go with me." That's a different issue. That's a different issue. You know, that's a different issue. But but you see, uh, so I instituted that for all all the people. I had at one point I had sixteen people working for me. I, you know, I just that's it. Come on. I, I found out in times when budgets were tight that that I couldn't reward people with money. I wanted to give them a bonus or something for the extra work. I'm looking through the HR regulations in the company one day. And I found out as a manager, I could give them a day off as a reward for whatever. Really? So I went to my manager. Oh, yeah, you can do that as often as you want. Really? So there were times I, I'd show up down there in, in Texas, and along about Wednesday, Wednesday was my management by walking around day, and I'm walking around, and, and I'd come into one of my employees. I'd say, so what, what's your schedule look like next week? He says, well, it's, it, it's pretty busy. Why? What, do you have any days that, where you don't have assigned meetings? And, and to, oh, no, he said, well, you know, Wednesday, I only got this one meeting Wednesday. How important is it, is it for you to be there? Well, you know, it's a regular meeting. Can one of the other product managers cover it? Well, yeah, they could. Why? I'm giving you that as a day off. I, want, I don't want to see you around here. And I don't want to see you logged in. <laughs> I'm serious. I don't. I don't want to see you logged in. I don't want to see you around here. Go home and tell your wife that, that you're not going to work that day and you guys do something together. And you, it's your day, you do what you want with that group. For you don't work for your house. Spend it with your, with your wife. And let, if she works, then you've got to do it. But you got the day off. Boy, I'll tell you, I got more mileage. I got more happy employees. More happy employees. I, I didn't just, they didn't become an expert. It might happen to an employee once, twice, maximum, maybe three times a year. Come on, well, how did I get that? Because you see what had happened is I began to bring number one into the workplace. And I began to say to number one, how would you manage this business? Number one, how would you, how would you manage the personnel in this business? Yeshua, if, if you were here, what are, the, what are the policies you would put in place? How would you handle this underperforming uh, employee? How would you handle a, 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 a man that, 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 that needs to be affirmed. And, and, and I began to pastor as a manager. What was I doing? I was doing just what we described. It's not, well, God, well, wife, well, children, and then this business, we all know it's fourth. No, 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 it's not fourth. It's right up here under number one. You, you see, my involvement there was just as important as my involvement with my children and as important as my involvement uh, with my wife it's just as important. It's not two, three, four. They're all equally important to Yahweh because wherever I am, I'm his son. I'm to be his son to my wife. I'm to be his son to my children. I'm to be his son to the people I work with. You're to be his daughter in, in whatever relationship you are. You're, you're the president's daughter. You're Yahweh's daughter. And in any relationship, it's not you're two, you're three, you're number four. It's that wherever I am, 
you're getting the presence of number one. When I show up, he's first priority. So when I'm with you, I'm thinking his thoughts. When I'm talking with you, I'm talking his thoughts. When I'm shopping in the store, I'm shopping with him. And so now I'm looking at the people in the store through his eyes. You see, Donna did that all the time, and when I didn't understand it, it used to drive me crazy. And we go out to eat, and we're talking, and she's looking at people. And I began to realize, finally I learned, she's looking through the eyes of Abba and praying for people. Young couples sit, come in to have lunch together, and they sit down. She's on her cell phone. He's on his cell phone. She starts praying for them. Abba, help that girl realize she's got a jerk. You don't want to marry him. Come on. You know. I, I, I came this close one time to walking up to a table. Of a, I mean, they come in. The guy is on his cell phone. He's paying little attention to her. And then when the dinner's over, she pays the bill. I was so close to just going over and saying, excuse me, ma'am, you can do much better than this. Are you aware of people? Are, are, are you, see, when you're, when you're first priority conscious, because there is only one priority in my life, then if you get me, you get priority one. By the way, if you get me, you get my wife. You get me, you get my children. You get me, you get my God. And if you get me, you get an excellent worker. I don't care what the job is. You hire me, you're going to get an excellent worker because I'm working for him. You're going to get a, a loyal employee. You're going to get an employee who's going to do everything he can to help your business become successful. That may be pointing out your failures because I'm not intimidated by you, so I want you to succeed, so why shouldn't I tell you? Have you ever thought of doing it this way? But you'll get a lot, you know, if you see me talking with somebody, you know, uh, in one of the quarters, you're the boss, you never, never, ever, 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 ever have to worry that I'm gossiping about you. Never have to worry. But when you get me as an employee, you know that if Don Long is having a conversation with people, he's speaking the best of those who are above him. Always, always, always. You need to know that. Hmm? So when you get me, you're getting, you're getting the best employee you could ever hire. Once you understand that, by the way, if you're in hiring employees, you hire loyalty, you train skills. You hire a work ethic, you train skills. I'm not looking for somebody who can do X, Y, Z. I'm looking for somebody whose attitude, I'll do whatever it takes to be successful. Hmm? Well, you and I can be that way. Okay? Did you get anything out of this today? Did, did you begin to get some refocus in life? That, that Abba, if we shift and, and, and from now on, it's, it's not just that we hear the word of God, but that word becomes part of us, and you become so much part of our conscious thinking that I don't have to say, oh, 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 yeah, I am married. Oh, 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 yeah, dumb me, I have children. Oh, oh, yeah, I do have a God. No, you know, my, my family, my life, and my God are all a part of who I am, and that's what I bring to the world. Amen? Father, we do thank and praise you for your love for us. Thank you for imparting wisdom to us today. Help us as we set our priorities to realize that we seek you first. We seek you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We devote ourselves totally to you. Any issue we have in interpersonal relationships and family, we resolve them by bringing them to you. Any issue that we have in the workplace, uh, any attitudes that, that we need to deal with in the workplace, we solve all that, Abba, by bringing it to you. You are our employer. You are the one that tells us what to do and how to do it and how to live right and how to, how to be honest and, and how to confront situations. So we have great confidence that your word will, will lift us up to a higher level where it simplifies as we realize we're seeking you first in everything we do, and all our priorities will fall into place, and all of God's people said, Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Holy One of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua, your God and Father, bless you richly beyond all measure. May he strengthen your image of who he is in your life. May he indeed be God of your life, because he has said, you are his people. May you walk forth very conscious 
of the fact that you represent the living God, Yahweh. And all of God's people said, Amen. We'll turn to somebody and say, I'm sure glad I was here today.